Television Advisory Council or committee for MCAT. So part of what our job is is to make sure that we have enough hours that broadcast local government, the university, as well as uh, the school district. And that local government is both the city and the county. And it's just one of the th reasons why we have MCAT here. But in large con larger context, it is all about education. So, without further ado, Anne Hughes, Communications Director for the Missoula County. Hi, I'm so excited to see all of you here in week seven. That's pretty awesome. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot tonight. I'm going to introduce our County Commissioner, Josh Slotnick, and our County Auditor, Dave Wall. And they're going to go through and talk about some of those bullets at the top of your agenda, which are some of our frequently asked questions. But um, we have two relatively new elected officials with us this evening, which is pretty awesome because they're in different stages of, of being involved in county government. and. Um, I get a little too far into the weeds on certain things, so it's good that you're hearing from, from them. But mostly I just wanted to thank you for being here and just say how excited I am that you guys are interested in learning about local government. So here's Josh. How's the night going to work? Well, you have the agendas in your, thank you, Josh. You have agendas in your binders. You have supporting documentation in your binders. Um, we're going to divide after this initial kind of hangout time here. We've got uh, until 7.20 in here. Um, we're going to divide into two groups, and I want to make it pretty even because I think your time is going to be better spent um, being in smaller groups so that you can hear and take in a little bit better information in a, in a smaller environment. We're going to do all sorts of fun stuff. We're going to end in the historic courtroom on the third floor of the courthouse. If you've never been in that room, it's stunning. Um, we're going to go. We're going to look at the 911 center. We're going to learn about justice court. We're going to learn about elections. There's all sorts of really cool nerdy government stuff that I just love <laughs> tonight. And we, and we finish here? We're going to finish actually upstairs in the historic courtroom. We'll do questions and answers up there. But you can leave your things here and they'll be just fine because we've got locked doors and everything's secure. So if you're w as you're going through the courthouse and doing your tour, if you want to leave stuff behind that you don't want to schlep around, totally acceptable. And I actually do want all of you to come back because I have homework to give you to <laughs> Okay, here's Josh Slotnick, County okay. Commissioner. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much for coming, not just to this event, but for being part of this seven-week kind of intensive course on local government. And it really says a lot about you all and about Missoula that we would have such a thing. This level of engagement is rare, and I'm kind of honored and humbled to chat with you this morning. So I was excited to do this partly because I'm really new at this. And you guys are in the act of learning about this, so we're, we're, there's some real parallels here. <laughs> so I thought what I would do first is start with a bit about what it's been like to be a county commissioner. Not so I can talk about myself, but because of the newness of it, I think might answer your questions on, well, what is it that county commissioners do anyway? And then I'll hit some of those bullet points, and then you'll hear from my buddy Dave Wall here, and then we're going to go walk around the courthouse and meet other elected officials. Okay. So here's, I'll, I'll dive in on that first part. So I just started maybe six weeks ago. And in my old job, I was very busy all the time doing things. And my new job isn't quite like that. My new job is a lot like being, and here's some, we're going to unpack these words, it's like being the executive director of a large nonprofit organization. Except it's not a one-person executive director. There's three of us. So it's a three-headed executive director of a nonprofit. Now, I say nonprofit because there's a really key difference between nonprofits and for profits, and it's not the thing you might be thinking, like, oh, it's about money. 
is that nonprofits evaluate themselves at the end of the day on how well they meet their mission. And I brought up the mission of Missoula County on my phone, but it's lame public speaking for me to stop and look at it and read it. But basically, it's that the mission of Missoula County is to provide essential services around the health and welfare for the people of Missoula and our environment. I get that basically right. That's what we're supposed to do. So, like most big nonprofits, we have people who do program. That means they're actually getting the work done. And then there's administration that makes sure the people who are getting the work done have all the tools they need, they need to do that work. So if you think of a nonprofit, anybody want to say a nonprofit? Pick one, anyone. Garden City Harvest. Garden City Harvest. Oh my gosh, you threw me the biggest <laughs> softball ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so the people who do program at Garden City Harvest, like I did up until six weeks ago, they grow food for low-income people. And then there's the administrative side who makes sure they have all the tools they need to do that. Well, Garden City Harvest is a modest-sized nonprofit. Missoula County is huge by comparison. We have nearly 1,000 employees. That's a lot of people and a lot of program. In terms of program, we're doing things like making sure you can get your driver's license done, that the roads are plowed, that you can get immunizations, that animals running around in the wrong places get picked up. And then because we have so many employees, we have to make sure that those folks' health insurances taken care of too, and that they have all they need in the world of, uh, of human resources. Oh, and then we do this small thing related to democracy called elections, which is super crucial, and you're going to hear it from Dana later. So the job of commissioners is not in program. We don't get any of that stuff done. We barely do anything. We're on the admin side. So it was, has been a little bit of a hard adjustment, but I'm getting used to it, and it feels like the three of us kind of sit and problems come to us and we listen and try and say something smart and fortunately we're surrounded by a core group of staff and is one of them and Sarah Bell, wherever Sarah Bell is, that are super razor sharp smart and actually know how everything works. And Vicki and Chris are part of that crew too. So right away I felt landing here that we all are in good hands because the people who are actually doing things really know what they're doing. And the commissioners, the other two, who I didn't know very well before, so I'm not just blowing smoke on this, I'm super impressed with. Dave is crazy, deliberative, and thoughtful, and Cola has an absolutely encyclopedic, intimidatingly encyclopedic knowledge of county government. So the three of us kind of sit and listen and try and guide things. But there's a whole mad set of other people that are actually getting things done. I don't know if that helps at all. You have a sense of what we're doing? We're the administrators. So those bullet points I'm supposed to hit, now I have to, I have to look. Oh. Yeah, this is a big one. City residents are county residents. Sometimes people we interact with at the county, especially in our far-flung parts of the county, which really mean we're in quite a diverse place if we have to represent the interests of people who live in Condon and people who live on the north side. Those are people who've made really intentional choices about where to live and how to live that are very different from one another. Well, people who live on the north side also live in the county, just like the people in Condon. Our tax structure is slightly different, and it's not worth going into right now, but we're in the same big boat. One of the, uh, these other bullet points says, can't we just get rid of those crummy elected officials? You guys aren't laughing at all. <laughs> Tough crowd. Can we just get rid of them, Dana? <laughs> these horrible elected officials? I have a job then. Yeah. So who gets, who gets rid of them? It's not us. It's not Ann or Sarah. Or, or Chris or Vicki or the other commissioners, it's, it's you all, it's the electorate. Now, commissioners are in office for a longer time, six years, but if you don't like what we're doing, you can bounce us out. Unfortunately, it's a slower, you gotta wait till the end of a term, but we have to be patient there. Other bullet points, um, I think I hit a little bit of the roles of county commissioner. Uh, checks and balances, and Dave's gonna talk about that. I'm not gonna steal your thunder as, a, as the auditor. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other county departments, um, big ones here that I'm going to rattle off, the big three, there's a bunch of them, but three of them that I feel like have interacted with a whole lot already, and our citizens interact with these three probably more than any other. The first one is CAPS, which is Community and Planning Services. So if you're dealing with subdivisions, zoning, uh, platting, any of that sort of development stuff, you're dealing with CAPS. They also deal with our grants program. And our grants program both gives money away and asks for money. So in small and indirect and direct ways, P 
people interact with our planning department all the time. The next one is public works. This is what I got an angry phone call about first thing this morning. Can you guess why I got an angry phone call? <laughs> the damn snow, right? He filled the cul-de-sac. We can't, what the hell? There's idiots. Oh, I yelled at the snowplow. The guy called me and said, he yelled at the snowplow guy. That like, probably didn't go well. <laughs> um, yeah, roads, public works. Everybody deals with roads every day. And then the third one that's really big is the health department. So if you go to a restaurant in Missoula, you can be rest assured that the food you're eating isn't going to make you sick because the kitchen was inspected by someone at our health department. If your neighbor beyond the reach of the sewer wants to, is planning on putting a septic system in and you have a well, you could feel okay that their septic isn't going to infect your well because someone from our health department had to inspect it. If you have a little child who needs immunizations, you can go to our health department and get immunizations. If you're thinking, this spring break, I'm going to go to India, you can go see a travel nurse at our health department. And our health department is a city county health department. It doesn't just belong to our county. And they have a relatively high degree of autonomy, which I won't try and describe because we would need COLA for that level of in the weeds. So those are three big ones. There's a bunch of smaller ones. Oh, elections is a big deal. The clerk and recorder over here are, is a big deal. And we're going to stop in and hear about some of those. And the whole justice side of this is huge. But we're going to meet judges and people who work in that system in just a few moments. So thanks for letting me chat with you. Can you hear from my friend Dave about uh, checks and balances? Yes, sir. Aren't the sheriff and the rural fire departments also part of it? Yes, sir. When I mentioned justice and we're going to hit on that, we're going to go talk to those folks. Uh, Missoula County is in an interesting situation in terms of officials in that we have a bunch of electeds. Mm -hmm. And Anka, should we rattle them all off? If you, have, if you look at this chart in your folder, anything that's dark blue is an elected official. And the judges, the district court judges, are a different color because they're elected officials, but they, their employees are state employees, not county employees. And also, uh, we don't do driver's licenses. We do vehicle Vehicle. Thanks. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I got that wrong. I meant the DMV stuff, not your driver's license. Your Title and registration. Yes. Thank you. And rural fire is its own special district, and that's a whole other thing, but we do have sheriffs and deputies and stuff. can get lots of detail here. It's tricky with lots of elected officials because county government is not, as you were pointing out today, is not, a, is not at all like a corporation where there's a CEO and she can say, this is how it's going to be. I can't call TJ and tell him what to do, and he can't call... Dave and tell him what to do, or me and tell him what to do. If we're going to work together effectively, and we have to, it's all based on relationship and cooperation and listening to each other, which is kind of why things go slowly, but it's also why I think they go pretty well. I better leave it there and hear from Dave. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Oh, boy. Wow. You better clap for me now. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Dave Wall, I'm the county auditor. Um, so obviously I'm talking about what the county auditor does, which you can already tell is going to be the funnest, most, ex most exciting part of the evening, uh, most exciting part of the evening today. Dave, could you speak up just a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm not, as, uh, I'm not as loud as Josh. And I'll actually move up a little bit too. That might help a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to start by telling you what I'm not. A uh, county auditor will not bang on your door telling you that you did your taxes wrong. You know, I'm not the IRS kind of an auditor. I'm an internal auditor for uh, the county government. Uh, there are, uh, according to state statute, every county with over 15,000 people has to have a county auditor. Uh, most counties, however, combine that with other departments, like clerk and recorder or something like that. Through the state of Montana, there are only six counties that have uh, an independently elected county auditor by themselves. They're uh, Missoula County, of course, thank goodness, uh, Yellowstone County, Gallatin County, Butte Silver Bow, Park County, and, and the last one you probably already know, but I'll just let you know it's Hill County, obviously. <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the reason I'm here, uh, uh, Josh already mentioned our, uh, our uh, mission, vision, values, and goals, uh, which are on our website. I really uh, recommend you uh, take a look at those. Uh, one of our goals uh, states uh, that we will responsibly manage financial and physical assets. So... Uh, to think about that, think about when you go to a, uh, a store or, or what the private industry is uh, involved in. Uh, the customers there will decide what they want to buy, 
and uh, they'll pay for it based on their decision and, and what their needs are. And then they really expect to get benefits that are about on par with, uh, with what they buy. So if you go to Best Buy and you buy a um, you know, $700 TV, uh, that's the one you choose and you'll hope you'll get $700 worth of value from, from that TV. Government's different. Uh, people pay taxes because they are compelled to. And um, although it, it, it's, it's, it's my view, I've told Josh this before, and I'm an elected official, so I don't mind saying it, I am a, uh, what you would call a tax and spend liberal. So I really believe that local government uh, can really provide services that will benefit the entire community, make the, the community a better place to live, and, and just for everyone's quality of life. However, it is true that most people will, will tell you that m much of the programs that their tax dollars go to may not uh, affect them directly, so they may not get that same benefit from, from what they're getting. This gives government a very special responsibility uh, with how their money is spent. Uh, it gives us a special responsibility to the taxpayers. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with the commissioners, what they do is they, they, they sort of, uh, you know, try and channel the electorate in deciding uh, what direction the county should be in, what programs are important, what programs are you know, should be defunded because they might be a waste or things like that. Uh, I look at it differently. Really, the, the, what I do is to make sure that tax money is not spent in what you would call an inappropriate manner. So, um, you know, do we have county vehicles that are being used for personal purposes? Things like that. I, I really uh, do my best to try and root out uh, abuse, you know, abusive policies and fraud and things, th things like that. So that's sort of my... Uh, that, that's why there is a county auditor. So thinking about combining those offices with others, of course we have so many small counties that many of them just have no choice to have that many elected officials would just break the bank, so they, they just have to do it. But for the larger counties, can you think of, let's say an auditor is combined with a clerk and recorder, can you think of the fact that there may be a conflict there? If, if they're looking into the spending of uh, another department that they're also the head of, How's that going to work very well? So that's, I mean, just my plug for the fact that uh, a county auditor should be in independently elected. Um, when I'm thinking about what I need to do, um, when I'm thinking about my boss, I'm not thinking about the county commissioners. I'm not thinking about uh, the CAO of the county. I'm thinking about, you know, over 100,000 people out there. So it, it really is good to sort of, sort of focus my mind on uh, what I need to do and, and, and my duties. So that is uh, sort of, that, that's why there's a county auditor. So you're probably asking, um, well, how do you do that? My second <laughs> card. <laughs> this is my whole, it won't take long. This is everything I got. <laughs> this is everything I got. So we have uh, county policies to uh, ensure how uh, tax dollars are spent, to make sure that they're spent appropriately and that county assets are used properly. Uh, I, uh, through several means, uh, ensure that county policies are being followed. Uh, one of the, uh, the, kind of the biggest way I do this is we audit claims against the county. Uh, these are bills, just bills that we pay. Departments will go and purchase goods and services, and then uh, those purchases have to go through the auditor's office to make sure that they're appropriate claims against the county. Um, we, we check a lot of claims. I can't say we check them all because there are so many, but there are two, there are two classes of claims we do 100% audit, uh, credit card purchases and uh, employee reimbursements. Um, historically, just kind of nationwide, these are the, uh, the two areas where you're most likely to find abuse and fraud. So we look at all of them. And, you know, we find a lot of mistakes, and hopefully they are mistakes. But, you know, if, if, if somebody, um, we, we just want to make sure we're not paying for somebody's vacation by paying for their flight. You know, that, that, that's sort of the main thing. We need documentation to show why it is they're, they're traveling or why it is they're being reimbursed for uh, why a piece of equipment or something like that. Uh, uh, I always say, in the, in the newsletter, I think the last newsletter, all the elected officials were asked to give a, a quote. They were asked, do you have a quote that you think of uh, as far as your job and being an elected official? And I thought, well, I better... I'll look at the brainyquotes.com and check out Abraham Lincoln, see what he had to say. And in the end, I didn't. I, I, I tried to do that because I like to use other people's ideas a lot. But I, in the end, I just decided to use something that I do a lot. One of it is, um, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. That's, that's, <laughs> something I, that's something I absolutely live by. And it's not, 
it's not very inspiring, but in my <laughs> line of work, <laughs> I, I expect to be in a book of quotes soon. And, and, and in my line of work, it, it really does come in uh, very, very handy. Um, I, I don't know how many times when I'm looking at claims and there's, there's not documentation, and so I contact the, the, the person who put in the claim, and they say, oh, well, here's what happened. Let me, let me tell you what happened. And it's always, you know, don't tell me, show me. Uh, it needs to be documented. Talk is cheap, right? So, um, and so that's, I know, sorry. I don't mean to get mean. That's not, I'm actually kind of a nice person. But that, that, that's sort of. <laughs> sort of. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that, that's kind of how I uh, look at things. Um, another big one, another a big way uh, that we ensure that money is not being spent inappropriately is, is procurement. Procurement, I mean large purchases. So, uh, you know, large contracts for services or construction contracts and things like that. When you think of government corruption, let me think now in my speech, I've already mentioned the word corruption and fraud. That's probably not great, but, <laughs> but when you think of government corruption, you often think of uh, these large uh, purchases, these large projects. You know, uh, oh, we need to, to build this or we need a lot of wiring done. Oh, oh you know, I know a guy or, or my, con my cousin owns a, a shop, you know. And so we need to make sure that uh, procurement is done uh, fairly and that there's a lot of transparency to it. So uh, the way we do that is we send out a, a request for proposal or an invitation for bid, basically a bid process. We make sure that it's uh, public so it goes into uh, the Missoulian on two consecutive Sundays, an ad that's saying uh, we wish to procure these services or this product or something like that. We also post it on the website and then uh, vendors will, will send in their, their bids. Uh, and if it's an actual bid where it's just the price that's going to determine those are open publicly and we read out the bids out loud. Um, if there are uh, RFPs where there's kind of, you know, sometimes price isn't the only factor. Uh, you really have to think about uh, the vendor's history and, and reputation and things like that. In that case, uh, a group of people will uh, open those up and kind of score them, make sure that they uh, are what they need and what's the best proposal will go that way. And this does two things that are very, very important. Uh, first of all, it makes sure that uh, taxpayers do not get sort of I'm sorry for this. I don't know how to say it. They don't get screwed over. You know, that the, the prices are, are, are proper. Uh, the other way is to make sure that vendors in the county, and every now and then we have a product or service that uh, cannot be supplied by uh, a vendor in the county. They have to go kind of nationwide. But most of the time they can. Most of our, most of our vendors are, are county departments. That's something that's actually in our purchasing and contract policy that we prefer to use county vendors. That's important to us. Um, so it, it makes sure that everyone has a fair chance. You know, it, it makes sure that every vendor feels like, okay, I have a chance to get this contract if my proposal is good. And so it's, it's just fairness in, in both those ways. Um, I will say we do uh, several rec reconciliations to make sure that uh, for like clerk of court, justice court, clerk and recorder, attorney's office, workman's comp, you know, they, they all have sort of accounts and, and, and paychecks from those accounts. So we make sure that uh, their records on their system match our accounting records countywide. And those are done monthly. Uh, so we, we, we just sort of are a double check on, on those things. And then finally, because it looks like we're about done, uh, we do cash counts at the treasurer's office um, to make sure that uh, the cash is handled properly. So it's once a month we do a surprise count. And uh, that's just another way we ensure that things are running properly. Any any quick questions before? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for the call. What do I ask for? Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Dave. Thank you, uh, sure. Josh. I hate following a funny man. <laughs> Dang it. Um, before we break into two groups, one group is going to start by going downstairs into the Emergency Operations Center and the 911 Center. And I just want to point out very briefly, I had the pleasure of serving on the Courthouse Renovation Project team. And this room in particular is something I wanted to highlight as part of that renovation project. It is part of the Emergency Operations Center when we have an incident that is active. So for example, in the flooding event in 2018, we were in this room every day for briefings and large public um, and stakeholder interest group meetings to learn what the daily briefing was and, and to gain information to take back to um, everyone's respective organizations and agencies. So 
So I like to point out that when, when we're remodeling and spending taxpayer dollars on uh, your, this public asset that is your courthouse, uh, we try to get as many uses out of these rooms as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So this is a cool room for that purpose, and it worked pretty well. Right, Adrian? Yes. Thanks. I, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to divide into two groups. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Dana Cosby. I'm the election administrator for Missoula County. There's only about four of us in the state of Montana. For most of the counties in Montana, this position is combined with another position, typically clerk and recorder. Um, but here in Missoula, we're big enough that one person couldn't do it all. So my position was created to be the person who handles all election stuff. And it's a lot of stuff. I'm only going to spend about six minutes with you because Tyler gets to spend the majority of the time with you. He's got two, two sections he's going to cover. So in your notebook, I did give you a handout with a lot of information on it because we do a lot of stuff. And we scale pretty big. So right now, since it's not really election time, um, there's a staff of five people who work the elections. And that's our full-time staff. But for a month before Election Day, we have a staff of over 200 people who work with us on a consistent basis. Election Day alone, Missoula County uses almost 600 people to manage the election process. So we, we shrink pretty small in non-election time, but during that election time, we, we grow pretty exponentially. Um, it's a lot of fun. I've been in an election since 2012. Um, the machines that we use here in Missoula County are machines that are used across the country. They are tabulators that count ballots for you. We operate with a precinct level tabulator here in Missoula County. We are one of 20, less than 20 counties that actually tabulate and count votes on the precinct level. Most counties bring that all into the, um, to the local office and count them in the office instead of counting them on election day in the precincts. So we're we pretty unique. Um, elections covers lots of things. I know somebody asked what does elections cover or what are the elected officials. There's a lot of them. Community councils, fire districts, water sewer districts, irrigation districts, hospital districts. I could go on. There's a lot. Sarah and, Sarah and my staff have long conversations about how many districts we have in Missoula County because it's, it's a large number. Right now, we are filing for school district. So if anybody's looking to serve on their local school district, please come see us. We'll be happy to sign you up for that wonderful opportunity to serve your community. Um, or if you don't fall in that category, again, water districts, sewer districts, a whole barrage of things. City elections are also coming up, so typically we see two to three elections per year. We don't just work one day a year or one day every four years. It's a constant process to keep up with that information. When an election ends, right now I've got tapes sitting on my desk to enter in information so that we can track when ballots were deposited on election day so our staff can better serve our voters on election day. We're constantly looking at ways to refine our processes, and we're constantly, 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 let me say it again, constantly <laughs> looking for new election judges. We train almost 700 people to work on election day, and we use almost all of those people. So if anyone is interested in joining us in that training, we will start training again next year in January, so you have a year to think about it. You'll probably see lots of media blasts about it from us, um, and we, we use people at the precinct level. We use people for late registration during that process. I do talk about that process in the handout that's in your packet, um, and we use people for count, the counting center. This year alone, um, we worked in the counting center for, 40, for 36 hours straight, not going home, not stopping. Machines did not stop. People did not stop. So it's a big deal. We work really hard. We put our heart and soul in it. It's time away from our family and friends um, to make sure that you all have the information from, from the electoral process. And we're excited to, 
to serve our community, and we would love for people to come and help us, help us do that. So if you're interested in that, either see me after this or come see us in January because we will be here ready to train people. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. I'm an example of one who's been doing it for 20 years, but in recent years I've been left out. They don't call on me. I don't know why. Oh, Larry. Well, the other thing I want to know is what's being done about the potential for voter fraud. I have a neighbor in my neighborhood, an elderly lady, who has a son who's lived and worked in California for over 20 years, and he votes absentee here. I want to know what's done to check whether he votes down there also, because he can vote twice. The same thing can happen with students here at the university. They can register absentee at home and vote there and register here. And vote. Sure. So let, let's address your first question. I, if you'll give me your name, I will let Marjorie know that you're still interested in serving. Um, she manages, I have somebody who manages our schedule for us as far as that goes, so I'll be happy to get that information from you. The second thing about voter fraud is, number one, it's a felony. <laughs> if you vote in two places, it is a felony. We have had several phone calls from other states into Missoula County regarding that, so there are people who watch out for that. So Larry, I know that's a question in your mind. Election officials do our job and we follow the process of if somebody lists a different state as their previous address, we remove them from our voter rolls. The states cross-check each other often and so if there is that case and it comes to us, it is investigated. There are people who investigate that. There are people who investigate that. Yep. Yeah, I made a complaint a few years ago when I worked the election about this one particular individual lives in California. Right. Well, the thing is, is you can, you, you, it's where you intend to return. So that's how, if he's not registered in California and he's registered here in Montana, he intends to return here. If he's not voting, I, I can't, I don't have time for a political argument about it, but <laughs> I can tell you that people do track that. Yes, ma'am. So, um, and, and I'm sorry if this is an offensive question, nope. no intent. Um, but when, so like in November when we were watching the election results come in, it seemed like Missoula County was slower to report than some of the other counties, but I think it's potentially because of the precinct counting that we do. Well, do you know yes and no. So in Missoula County, we own three machines that we we run our ballots through. Missoula County did report at 8 o'clock with the rest of the state. We decided since we had so many um, big countywide issues on our second page of the ballot, including the bond that affects everyone's pocketbooks, that we would count them in sync. We would count page one and page two at the same time. So when we reported at 8 o'clock in this November election, we actually had processed 20,000 pieces of paper since 8 a.m., but other counties had processed 20,000 pieces of the first page. We were, we were interested in what was also happening on our county level, so that's why we chose to process both sheets at the same time. Yes, sir. I was going to mention, I saw this thing going on in North Carolina, so nothing like that could ever happen here, right? Well, in North Carolina, which is interesting, North Carolina actually does not allow ballot harvesting. So you're referring to the new election in North Carolina. It is due to the fact that, they, that there was an individual harvesting ballots. That is permitted here in Montana up to six ballots. You can deposit someone else's ballot up to six ballots per election cycle. In North Carolina, it's not allowed at all. And so their issue was they were harvesting ballots, number one, for people they didn't know, number two, and not turning them in. So there were several issues. But so we can harvest here though. You can harvest here. So yeah. Yes, sir. So it, if you vote absentee, does that mean your name is not on the list at your local voting booth station so that it prevents you from voting twice? Correct. So if you vote absentee or an absentee is sent to you, we print the registers on Saturday after we close and if your ballot had been received by then, it'll show received in the register, and your name is still there, it just shows the ballot's received. If you were sent a ballot and we have not received it, it says ballot sent, and um, we get, we, you would, if you showed up there, you would be offered a provisional ballot. It would come back to our office. We would research that 
and then make the determination whether or not you had already returned the ballot or not. Good. Yep. So I'm going to turn it over to Tyler now. <laughs> <laughs> No, if you don't hear what I say, that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Tyler Gernant. I'm the elected clerk and treasurer for Missoula County. Um, I'm going to try and sort of speed through this to maybe make up some time because I think you guys are behind. Um, we are, so a lot of you probably know, or maybe you don't know, what goes on in our office. Um, the recording site is where we're at right now. This is where all of your land transactions get recorded. So if you buy a house, this is where the deed gets recorded, your mortgage gets recorded here, vital records, um, so birth and death records. On that side is the part that you're probably more familiar with, um, waiting in our lobby. That is the DMV side. Uh, that is where you register and title your vehicles. It's also generally where you'll pay property taxes. Um, we are sort of like on the treasurer side we do the the motor vehicle stuff but we also act as the bank for the county um, and for all of the extension agencies so we collect their deposits we deposit them with our actual bank um, and we do all of the receiving and recording of, of where those monetary transactions go in terms of the funds um, so that's the really quick boring side um, we we're a mission driven organization we're a unified organization and so um, all, all of that, what it really comes down to is our mission is to pr protect, promote, and defend the economic interests of Missoulians. Uh, and that sounds very sort of high-minded high for what I just told you. But, um, but it really is very true because ultimately what we do in our office um, allows for a ton of economic activity in Missoula. Um, if we didn't record deeds uh, in countries, there are countries that don't have deed registers. Um, you can't build a house because um, nobody will loan you the money to, to build, put some structure on a piece of property that they don't know you own. Um, you can't buy a car because nobody will loan you money on a car if they don't know that you own it. And so um, we, we protect about $15 billion in economic activity in the Missoula County area, um, and that's ex extremely vital to the local community. Um, in addition to that, we collect about $250 million every year in taxes, um, both on the property tax side and the um, motor vehicle side. Some of that goes to the state, but most of it stays right here in our community uh, and funds your police and your fire protection that also protects your economic interests and your activity. Um, boy, I breezed through that pretty quick. I'm pretty <laughs> impressed with myself. <laughs> Two things in your binders. We have a document we call the budget and brief, and there's one for F fiscal year 2018 and a newer one for fiscal year 2019. There's a lot of really great information about how county budgeting works, what, what it comprises, the stuff that all the collections that uh, Tyler just talked about. There's some really good information in there, but I also just want to emphasize that we're here to answer questions if you don't get your questions answered tonight. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll take questions. That, um, I also, before, I really want to point out, because we have this really cool new system for our motor vehicle side, um, where you can actually, um, in fact, the, the website for it is called getintheline.us, um, and then you can also check our line by going to checktheline.us. Um, and so you can actually enter our line from anywhere that has internet access, um, and then you can check and see. It'll send you a text or uh, an email message updates um, when you're seven people out, so you don't necessarily have to be in our lobby um, getting angry at our clerks um, <laughs> in order to be waiting in line to do a title transaction. Um, and then also it's, it just makes it so that you can also see if, you know, if you go to that check the line and you see there's 40 people in line ahead of you, um, maybe today ain't the day. Um, but um, also just as a little tidbit, um, the first of the month, the end of the month, um, Mondays and Fridays are always bad. Um, any time surrounding a holiday is generally going to be bad. So if you combine those three, um, you're probably coming in on the worst day that you possibly could for our office. Um, but you had a question. You were talking about banking. Does the, does the county have its own accounts with a commercial or credit union, or and how do you choose who gets that business? We do. We we put out what's called an RFP or a request. Actually, I think it's an RFQ. Um, a request for solicitations, yeah, um, and so that hasn't, I don't know when the last time that happened was, but it was before I started. Um, right now we have uh, First Interstate Bank as our banking institution, but we collect all our money and send it to them. We keep account of it sort of separately, but it's sort of like your checking and savings account. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
<laughs> I'm Adrian Beck, and I'm the director for the Office of Emergency Management. Office of Emergency Management really has two um, distinct but also inextricably linked offices. So we have the DES side of the house, which you're on right now, and our 911 center, which is down the hall. So our 911 center answers 911 calls, no matter where they're generated in the county, whether it's on a cell phone or a landline phone, 365 days a year. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. 365 days a year, we have people down the hall that are answering those phone calls and then directly dispatching the, the necessary resources to deal with and mitigate that emergency. When that emergency is different than just a single agency response or even a two agency response and maybe is going to last a couple days and involve more people, that's really when this side of the house gets involved. So in the state of Montana, every jurisdiction is required to have a disaster and emergency services coordinator. Now we speak an acronym, so I'm going to try really hard not to do that, but a disaster and emergency services coordinator um, has the role and the responsibility for doing disaster planning for that jurisdiction. So the city is required to have one and the county is required to have one. The Office of Emergency Management through an interlocal agreement is a city-county department in that DES and 911 services are for the city and the county. So the DES coordinator, me, <laughs> has the responsibility for doing the emergency planning for and doing that coordination role in a disaster or emergency for the city and the county. DES ties its roots, disaster and emergency services, ties its roots back to um, civil defense. So that's why we're down in the bunker in a basement. Mm -hmm. And the sun doesn't shine. <laughs> <coughs> and so the role really is to identify what hazards we're vulnerable to, develop plans so that we know how to respond to them, and to make sure that everybody knows what the job is. Sounds easy, right? So what do you think our number one hazard that we face in western Montana? Fire. It's an easy one, right? Wildfire, right? Okay, number two? Flood. Flood. Very good. Number three? They get harder from here. <laughs> okay, severe weather is number four. Earthquake? Number three, number uh, earthquake got bumped down this last go around, number six. <laughs> number, number three is hazardous material spills. So if you think about what we're vulnerable to, what happens on a routine basis probably, not even necessarily routine, but a frequent basis, and has significant impacts or has the potential to have very significant impacts, those top three really start to make some sense with our proximity to the interstate, our proximity to Montana Rail Link, and then we have a major pipeline that comes into our uh, jurisdiction and a huge fuel bulk plant out, um, out there as well. So what do we do with that? Our job is to develop plans based on what we're likely to face and to make sure that we're prepared for that. And so wildfire being our number one thing, we develop a plan specifically for wildfire, right? So we have a community wildfire protection plan, which takes that wildfire hazard, breaks it apart a little bit more, analyzes it in a little bit more detail, and then really tells us where our hazards exist, which then tells us where we need to focus our energy, where we need to focus grant funding to get more fuel mitigation done, where we need to focus public outreach and education about preparedness for wildfires and evacuations and public alerts and warnings and those kinds of things. But it also tells us what we need to do in terms of coordination because the function of the EOC, and this is kind of a joke in Montana, right, is that the DES coordinator and the emergency operations center are one and the same and that you don't need a big space to have an emergency operations center, you just need someone who is coordinating all of the different, sometimes diverse agencies and objectives of those agencies to make sure that everybody's needs are being met. And so the EOC is less of a space, though we often need a space for everyone to gaggle up, it's more of a function for that operational coordination. And so when we think about wildfire, Think about all the different agencies that are involved when we have a really large event going on, something that's more than just one or two fire departments going to and putting out. Typically, we have the Forest Service. We have a completely different dispatch center that, that dispatches state and federal resources. We have state resources. Sometimes the tribe is involved. We have 12 different local um, fire districts that could be involved at some level or degree. We have the Sheriff's Department. We have 
the road department. Sometimes it's a public health issue. And so our job is to get all those people around this table and make sure that we all have a common understanding of what the issue is, we have common objectives, and that we are developing tasks that meet those objectives to resolve that situation, whatever it may be. In this case, it's wildfire. So literally thinking like, what am I going to talk to these people about? I went and pulled a piece of artwork off the wall as a demonstration of kind of what our role in DES is. And so if you look at this map, this is a map that we had framed up as a, uh, a reminder of the 2017 wildfire season and just whenever we're feeling like we have some post-traumatic stress to so just take a look at it. Um, this is of the Lolo Peak Fire. So if you look at this map, there's all kinds of different symbols, lots of different colors, and they all mean different things to different folks. But that's really what our job is at Disaster and Emergency Services, is to create the map for whatever incident we're talking about, to make sure that everybody understands what the symbols are, that we all are talking the same language, and that we all have common objectives and common goals to, to resolve the issue. And so just as a highlight of some of the things that we're working on in rooms similar to this, whether it's here in the courthouse or out at, the, at Forest Service headquarters or wherever the incident command post might be for an incident, these yellow kind of squares that are around the edges of, of the fire perimeter, the fire perimeter is in, in red, so some of these yellow blocks and the red blocks down there, are evacuation zones. Now a lot goes into determining where those lines are going to go. It's not just walking up to the map and saying, I think this makes sense. We have to figure out who needs to be involved in that evacuation decision first and foremost. Do we have the proper authority to actually evacuate folks? Because um, little known fact, the sheriff does not have the authority to evacuate you. <laughs> the county commissioners and the mayor do. And so through an emergency declaration process or a disaster declaration process, we do a delegation of authority from those officials that have that authority down to the people that actually need to make those decisions and do that work. So we need to make these lines logical as to the resources that we have available. If we did one great big polygon there and said, okay, TJ, take your guys and go do that, we may have created lines through um, normal passageways that they would not be able to secure those egress routes or to secure those routes once we have people out of there to make sure that nobody else comes into there. And so just creating those polygons takes a lot of coordination to make sure that everybody's needs can get met when at the end of the day, we have to make a decision for public health and safety. I just want to interrupt really quickly. If you have already seen the 911 center and you want to group up back with your original group, because I think we might be able to transition now. Yep. Um, if you could take them upstairs uh, to the tre uh, treasure. Okay. And then we should be maybe back on track for a minute. <laughs> yeah. And then we're and then uh, my group we're going to go with. Uh, so if you started with me and you started with Dana and. And Tyler, we're going to go with Sherry and go into the 911 center. Perfect. So the four main positions we have to fill are uh, main phones, which answers all the 911 lines, uh, fire medical, and they dispatch uh, all those units. Then we have a person who sits at the county uh, dispatch. They take care of all the deputies on the street. And then one for PD, for the police department. Um, we like to have five to six people in the center because if you think about it, we have 2,600 miles here and one person answering all the 911 lines is a lot, a lot, especially when you take into consideration the last couple of days and all the snow and the roads and how that was. So it is a lot. So we do back each other up, but again, we like to staff up a little bit and see if we can get five to six people in. Um, tonight we have two people who are just getting off of training and uh, three or four other senior people. Um, they they ha each have four uh, monitors in front of them, two pretty large uh, ones. Those house our uh, computer-aided dispatch system. That's how we take a call. That's how we dispatch a call. That's how we keep track of all of our units, fire, medical, and law enforcement. Uh, the monitor on the small monitor on the right is their telephone, and the small monitor on the left is their radio console. Um, these flip cards that you see at some of the stations, there's one right here. That's called our EMD, Emergency Medical Dispatch. Uh, when we're trained here, you have to be certified in EMD to be able to take a medical call and help 
assist them with whatever they need and give them the right uh, service that they need. So. Yeah, they work uh, 212s and 28s right now, so they're here a long time during the day. Um, we do have a full kitchen so that they can bring food and make food. Um, we also have what's called a quiet room so they can get away from all of this for a while and maybe just sit, relax, play on their phone, do whatever, something to get them away from all of this. can be a lot. Do you guys have any questions? What are the um, colored lights? Colored lights, perfect. A red means they're on the radio and yellow means they're on the phone. So when I come out to talk to somebody, I don't interrupt them most of the time. <laughs> I think it's interesting that I just learned that it's not only emergency calls that come in here. Correct. Yeah. If you call a police department and you need an officer's response for any reason, even though not an emergency, it comes to the emergency re response center here. Yeah. So we're the only ones who dispatch. Yes. We're the only ones dispatched dispatch to any type of responder. So if you need a responder of any type, they're going to transfer you here. If you might as well call 911 to start with. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we do take non-emergent and emergent calls. What was, yeah, like what was yesterday yeah. like during the blizzard? It was bad. <laughs> it was busy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your highest volume call day? It was about three years ago in August when we had the windstorm that came through. Do you remember that? Were you here? Okay. We take approximately 300 to 400 calls in a 24-hour period here. We took 350 calls in an hour. Oh, my Lord. So what is the reason people were calling yesterday? Um, accidents. accidents, yeah, mostly accidents, Sli accidents, or and or sliding off the road, or roads impassable, yeah, yeah, those are the biggest. How many employees? Uh, we can have 29. We have 23 currently. Yeah, so we're down six right now. What is the EMD? Is that what you? Emergency have? medical dispatch. So and if and somebody calls in with some sort of medical problem, whether it be. Um, my husband's not breathing or you know I cut my finger and I don't know what to do we have a card that's going to help guide us to what level of service that person needs and if it's CPR or something we can we can walk them through CPR or giving child childbirth and stuff like that so, so you don't have EMTs actually on staff or nope. OEC or nope. it's just that card yes yeah Which should it be trained in the card we do have to it's, yep it's a 40-hour class that we do in-house um, that we, they have to be trained through that before they can start taking their medical calls. So how much did you guys wait? Uh, they start out at a little over 17, where am I at? Uh, a little over 17 and within a year they go up one dollar. They are in a union and the way they have their pay scale set up, there's quite a pretty big bump in the first 10 years. So they're, they do pretty well. <laughs> Is it like eight-hour shifts, three shifts a day for 24 hours? Uh, we, right now, currently, they're doing two 12-hour shifts and two eight-hour shifts a week to make up their 40. Yeah. Um, they just went from three 12s and a four to this. But we had to do this because we were down in staff, so, yeah. Do you rotate, like, who's on first, second, third, or one second, and you're on first shift? And you're always on first shift? Nope, they rotate every three months. Okay. Yep. So the shift that they bid... At the, at the end of the year for the next coming year, they're going to be on those same days off throughout the year. Okay. They're just going to switch back and forth from days to nights. Um, yeah. I don't need to be the bell No, you're fine. I'm going to move upstairs and go, we're going to go visit Justice Court. All right. You guys have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. It's my office to work for her in, in municipal court before I was elected as the Justice of the Peace. And the main difference between uh, the, the sorts of cases that you'll see over there versus over here has to do with um, who gives you a ticket. So uh, for criminal things, if a uh, one of those nice new uh, outfit folks from the city police give you a ticket, it goes through municipal court. If it is the sheriff's uh, office, if it's the highway patrol, fishing game, motor carrier, animal control, animal control, live. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Keep your brands up to date. Uh, all that stuff then comes through justice court. So those same kind of uh, misdemeanor cases. The, the other difference that we get is we do 
felonies or civil so both in the case. Both two down are different. So we also between Alex and I both see all of the felonies who make their initial appearance in justice court, we set bail in the release conditions and then usually a few weeks after that they'll make their appearance and be arraigned in district court. So so that's um, there. We see about ten times as many cases as district courts. So the volume of our courts is pretty busy. So in addition to all of that, we also see civil cases. Justice Court is what's called a court of limited jurisdiction. So there's a limit on what we can see with regards to civil aspects. And then you also heard some of the limits with regards to criminal. It's misdemeanors or tickets. We just see the initials on the felonies. But with regards to civil matters, there's a, there's a um, financial limit of $12,000. There's also, we do small claims. We do all of the landlord-tenant cases that are under $12,000 in Missoula County. We do temporary orders of protection. Um, and the very best part of our job is that we marry a lot of people. <laughs> so there's nothing like ending the, the, the day with, um, after a bunch of disputes and what have you, that you end up seeing, you know, sending a couple people happy off into the day. Most of <laughs> 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 yes. Divorces happen on the fourth floor. We never know what happens after that. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, in terms of civil cases, you know, that limit is $12,000, and most of what we get, frankly, are mm -hmm. uh, collection cases. So somebody owes somebody money, and uh, you know, I don't have the numbers, but I'll bet 90% of them are filed by collection agencies. So it's not the most exciting stuff, but it is, uh, you know, an important part of keeping our commercial system running. I think one of the neat things too about Missoula County um, Justice Court is that we send almost all our civil matters to mediation, and we contract with the um, Community Dispute Resolution Center, the CDRC, and they mediate um, most of our civil cases. And that actually results in about 75% of our cases being coming to an agreement between parties, which I believe is much better for the community and for the parties. Otherwise, it comes to us. We get to make a decision. Not everybody's always happy, um, and there's just a better. It's a better way to have a say in that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, sure. Do you get involved in divorces or dissolutions, or nope. unmarried people who decided they didn't want to be married? <laughs> We don't. That happens up in district court. We might get involved in the beginning end if it's an order of protection or a cr criminal act that is involved, but nothing in the full process of it. We're not yeah. sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the criminal side of the cases that you see and not counting traffic tickets and that kind of stuff, are you seeing any trends that are increasing or decreasing in terms of what's going on in our community? Mm. I don't have any statistics to back that up, but it seems like there's a lot more partner family member assaults that have been happening. Um, with regards to DUIs, I have some current stats from this year compared to last year, and we've actually gone down just slightly with misdemeanor DUIs. That does not negate the problem that we have with alcohol in our community and, and the culture that it revolves around that. So that is another big part. So just um, we see first, second, and third DUIs, um, aggravated DUIs and drug DUIs. When it becomes a fourth, then it goes up to district court. So, um, yeah. So you don't see meth cases go to district court, is that? Felony case, what did you say, I'm sorry? Meth, meth, methamphetamines? Yeah. Correct. Right. Correct. Any possession, any amount of methamphetamine goes to district court. Under 60 milligrams of marijuana stays down here with us, mm -hmm. if that's the sole charge. This, this is a stupid question. Do you recognize uh, tax return marriages? When people decided to pull out jointly, that marries them in the IRS view. No, but I'll start watching. <laughs> <laughs> I've married several over the years. <laughs> huh. I've seen people get married because, I mean, for health insurance benefits, I've seen that more in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't pry. <laughs> I can't believe we're done under 10 minutes. That's amazing. Okay. Such a great time. Should, should we talk about the DUI court as long as you have a second? Oh. Okay. So we have two pilot programs going on in Missoula County. One you're going to kind of hear about in the news is called the Public Safety Assessment, and that's a risk assessment with regards to people who are incarcerated. That was something out of the legislature two years ago. There's some funds that came with that, and so the Supreme Court has. Um, is, is running a few pilot programs, five, and Missoula County is one of those to try and get some numbers and some baseline evidence-based numbers to 
what the risk factor is for people who appear released with regards to bail setting. There's a national trend that's happening with regards to bail reform, and we're kind of taking a look at it to try and make a more regular base or foundation for those release conditions. So then the other part is DUI treatment court. Um, I was instrumental in writing a grant and we have started a treatment court here. What's interesting about that with the court, you might think um, that there is funding that comes with that through the Supreme Court or anything, but it's not. <coughs> treatment courts really reduce recidivism and it uh, has a holistic approach to people with substance abuse issues. And so actually in a couple of weeks we'll be starting, we've screened uh, some of our first participants and um, that will be a separate docket will use incentives and sanctions to hold them accountable. It's more intense. I mean, people have to actually want to be a part of that and to be held accountable. But there's some incentives with regards to their fines and their jail time. Um, but it, it's, it, I think it's really good. We're looking to expand that next year. Pardon me? How many people will participate? So the first year, we were willing to take up to 20 people. And so we're taking high BAP, BAC or repeat offenders. And so last year, 2017 stats out of just Missoula Justice Court, there were 87 possible people who could have participated. Um, and so in this last year, it was actually 74. Um, so it ne there needs to be screening and some certain things that they need to be a part of that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh oh. Well, I want to put one. I, maybe yeah. you can speak to it. Do we have a veterans court that's set up in the county? We do in district court. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a different level, but. They can help with misdemeanor cases, though, as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Do federal agency tickets come to this court? No. They go over to the federal courthouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you see juvenile offenders, or do they have their own separate court? Traffic cases and fish and game. And uh, NIPs. NIPs, thank you. Uh, those just come through here. Uh, you get to see them with their parents, and it's an exciting process. <laughs> uh, <laughs> otherwise, more serious things get routed through youth court, which is basically district court. Mm -hmm. Are water rights a state issue? Do they come through here at all? Or water rights? No. They get through district court and water on um, water court, right? Specialty course. Yeah. So. Okay. We are very happy yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that guy will answer all those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Sure. Yeah, I, I will not answer any questions. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I, I do work for a district court doctor. Yes. Any other questions? All right. Thanks. Have a great night. Thank <laughs> South entrance to the courthouse. I didn't introduce the two judges downstairs. I realized I should have done that, but I will introduce Ted Hughes. He's the curator of collections from the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. He also happens to be my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi, thanks everyone. Um, my name's Ted Hughes, like she was saying. I'm here to talk about these beautiful paintings that have been hanging here since 1914. They were painted by local Yokel uh, Edgar S. Paxson, who was friends with um, Charlie Russell, uh, Buffalo Bill. Um, he came out to Montana from back east in the 1870s. He wanted to be a frontier guy, but he got here sort of right when the frontier was coming to a close, not long after Little Bighorn. So, and he was a scout for a while for a, a wagon company. He uh, know, knew how to make his own buckskins, live off the land, hunt fish. He really wanted to be a frontiersman, but he got out here just a little too late. Um, so you'll see some of that romantic yearning, the, the mythology of the West, of the heroic settlers, captured in these paintings, like this sort of nostalgia for what, that he missed that heroic era. But what happened here, which I think is a great uh, example of how cool Missoula is. Um, uh, so the courthouse opened in 1910, made by a local, or a local architect, A.J. Gibson. Um, uh, made our beautiful courthouse, but it had this kind of crappy art in it that had nothing to do with the local area. It was very generic and stock art. 
So the people of Missoula complained about it, rose up. It was in the newspaper. The Missoulian was complaining about it. Um, the Missoula Women's Club led the effort to have the art replaced. And they hi hired uh, Edgar Paxson to do the paintings. He had just finished six paintings at the uh, courthouse in Helena. Um, and they wanted art that had to do that talks about the local area. So you'll see like Father Ravalli coming here, uh, Lewis and Clark, there's old Toby crouched down, Sacagawea in the background. Uh, here's uh, Lewis crossing the Clark Fork and they're coming back from the coast. And uh, I wish he would have done the part when, like it was in June, so the water was really high and Lewis was on the, one of the rafts in the branch, grabbed him and pulled him off into the river. <laughs> but he didn't. He wanted it. You'll notice everyone looks pretty heroic in their poses and everything. Very detailed, accurate clothing. He was friends uh, with, like he knew Chief Charlo. He was very friendly with the local Indian tribes. Um, so like here you see a comparison. Here's the white men uh, gathering some meat there on the left and on the right there's the Indian people harvesting meat. There's a nice heroic comparison there. Um, this is uh, when the Salish were marched out of the flathead. Down here is the signing of the Hellgate Treaty where they didn't realize it but they were signing away the Bitterroot they thought that they were going to get the current flathead reservation in the Bitterroot. And there was a couple nice priests that were saying, no, wait, stop. But they ended up signing it anyway. But they stayed there till 1892. This doesn't show the army that was marching them out. There's a pretty famous photograph of the Salish people going over the Higgins Bridge. But, but here they seem proud and stoic and noble. I, I don't, you can, it's kind of romanticized, but you can draw your own conclusions about leaving out the but That's a tragic, sad story, but a piece of our history, and it's all captured here on these paintings. Um, so by the 1970s, these paintings were starting to fall apart. When they installed them, they just glued them straight to the wall. So the moisture was coming through straight onto them. There was mold, paintings were cracking, and falling apart. So they, back then they had block grants to the state where the feds would give a chunk of money to each state. And a certain amount of that went to the Montana Historical Society who dispensed a pretty good sized grant to restore the uh, paintings. And it was a guy named Gustav Berger who was a, an excellent conservator in New York City. So they had to take them, carefully take them off the walls, ship them to New York to be carefully conserved. And he repaired all the paintings to the beautiful condition that they are today. And he mounted them on aluminum stretchers so that the paintings would be allowed to breathe based on the change in the humidity and temperature here. Um, and they found a couple under these square ones. Uh, artists will use a piece of canvas to back the canvas they're working on to kind of stiffen it. And when he was x-raying them and cleaning them, he noticed that there was a couple paintings underneath these two that Paxson had used, recycled to uh, size, they call it sizing, to size these paintings. And those are down here in the next stairwell. Oh, okay. yeah. We'll walk right by and we'll make yeah. one of our next stops. Are we doing on time? Okay. One thing I just want to say is that as part of the Shorthouse Renovation Project,
I think oh, it's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They did a beautiful job. They just have this sort of weird trim around them. For you know, it was okay, but these are the same frames that they used to frame paintings up in Glacier Park uh, by this famous railroad guy who worked for the railroad named uh, Ferry. So beautiful sort of turn of the century feel. To it. Um, so kudos to the county for uh, cleaning up. And the, uh, the funny thing is that when <laughs> when they first took these down around 79, and then they put them back up behind the the Native American hunting the buffalo. Someone wrote, Paxson is a bleeping nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of true. He was like the, I see him as a proto-nerd because he was so dedicated to, you know, learning about the Wild West and studying Native Americans. like Kind of like we would with Game of Thrones today. <laughs> but, for example. For, as an example. But, yeah. So Ethan, you have one of these in your binder. It's about the Paxton paintings. Ted may or may not have been an author on this brochure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So hey everybody, my name is Brenda. I'm the public information officer for the sheriff's office. I was just saying, I have two kids, so I, I'm like, people stay out this late? I don't even know. <laughs> like, they haven't been out this late in a long time. So um, if you have questions along the way, just let me know. You can kind of stop me. Um, we're going to kind of be in close quarters every now and then, so I'll talk as loud as I can, but get comfy with each other. This is the closest you'll get, I think, in this room. And not all of you have to go in. <laughs> <clears throat> but I just wanted you guys to kind of look in this room and get a feel for it because when the courthouse was designed they asked specifically for a soft interview room like this so if we had to interview children or um, certain families when we had that hijacking a few years ago um, the family from Washington was on a way to their, a graduation and they had to stay in here for several hours so it was just a comfortable place for them to sit um, and like I said there's toys and stuff in the corner for kids you'll kind of see the contrast from the soft interview room to the hard interview room where we actually have suspects a and box. yeah it's yeah it's a box and actually every time the door clicks open the camera pops on so you're all being recorded <laughs> 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 So, so sometimes we have suspects that we have to bring in here um, and interview them. This is just one of the holding cells we use. Um, like if a detective or somebody has to step away from them for a little while, they'd be held in here. Um, but as you walk by, you can see the hard interview room in here. It's a lot smaller than the soft interview room. And then you'll make your way around here. And if you just look right, we also do fingerprinting for the public. So you'll see the little machine that way. And then I'll meet you guys out here. So actually for the size of Missoula County, we have only, we have just 55 deputies. So at any given time, we have anywhere from four at a minimum to six deputies on at any given shift. We have four shifts, shifts um, throughout the week. So we have two night shifts, two day shifts that rotate from the beginning of the week to the end of the week. And then every, every morning at 6.30, we have a team that comes on and goes off, but they have a little briefing and say, this happened overnight and this is, you know, what you need to be aware of or we're following up on. And then at 6.30 at night, um, another shift comes on. So we do actually just had a shift change a little while ago where there was about 10 people in the pit. We have two canines. So one of our canine handlers 
Sometimes they're called out. They're not always on shifts since there's just two of them. Um, so they're called out a lot depending on stops um, or sometimes they're just patrolling if it's a slow week, which it hasn't been in Missoula County. So um, this is the civilian side. Um, on the other side, it's warrant officers. And then here we do warrants. We do um, evictions. We do temporary order of protections for victims. And that all comes out of this office. We work very closely with the county attorney's office uh, to determine warrants and TOPs. And um, so that's all kind of here. And the, the men and women here make it's kind of the lifeblood of the department, if you will, in terms of making those things happen. So do you guys have any questions so far? Just trying to go so fast. Okay. As you guys walk by, you can see the board. We have our detention staff and then also our sworn sworn officers and then our civilian staff there on the bottom. So this is the sheriff from the under sheriff's office. We're going to go through the detective unit over there. And then this actually is what we call the pit and the sergeant's office. So this is where patrol and a lot of our admin, like our captains and lieutenants, all stay kind of on this side. And then detectives are on this side. And then we'll make our way into briefing. And I'll tell you a little bit more. But this is every morning at 8.30, we do a briefing in here. So we have civilian admin and detectives and then any patrol people. And sometimes the detention facility here, we go over what happened the night before and just kind of know what we need to be aware of and what's being followed up on. Uh, we, like I said, run the detention facility. So we have roughly 115 people there. Um, we're also the coroner for the county. So we have multiple coroners on um, at any given time. We have coroners that are on call, so any unattended death. Um, we have corners from our office that go out. Um, we're the only ones in Missoula County. And um, we work really closely with our departments. Um, jurisdictionally, we have jurisdiction throughout Missoula County where like the PD has to stay within city limits. But we work really closely with MHP. We also have, um, yeah. Do you have a night shift briefing also? Yeah, so every time there's a shift change, they have that little briefing while people are coming on and going off. So. Um, and we also have, we do search and rescue. Um, it's a volunteer based group. They're just wonderful. They do a lot of things here in Missoula County. We're lucky that we have the resources of Two Bear Air too, because that's just been game changing here in Montana. But um, so with just a small staff, we do a lot of stuff and it's always busy. I'd like to say it's bustling a lot, but really people are on the go. Uh, you know, the detectives are out interviewing or out at detention. Um, so it just really depends on the day. Do you guys have any questions? How many are on the staff? We have 55 sworn deputies. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Last, my last group, I was like, and there's drugs, and there's all these things, and they were like, is there anything good? <laughs> <laughs> and there is. There is. Um, we do a lot of outreach with kids and work with community groups, so that stuff is good. We work on a lot of different task forces, so we have like the FBI task force. Um, we also work with Haida and. Um, they've been doing great work in terms of getting drugs off the street. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more meth and heroin in Missoula County, so that's a problem. Can you, what's that acronym? HIDA. HIDA. So it's a, um, it's a drug task force. It's a high intensity drug trafficking area. Um, it's a long one. <laughs> so we work with like the DEA, um, ATF and FBI, city, we have all different people from different agencies have people that go out and work at HIDA and they work there depending like three years and then they come out because they're doing the undercover stuff and um, you know just a few years ago we had a bad deal go down and one of the officers got shot at PD so those are the when you hear HIDA those are the undercover guys that are doing that stuff. Thank you.
Do you know where the drugs are coming from? Yeah, actually, you don't see really the at home like meth baking anymore that you used to see because we have so much meth coming from Mexico, and it's like 99% purity. So there's just not that need anymore to make it at home because it's become so accessible. Um, and you know, with um, opioids and stuff like that, a lot of people that's where that heroin came back up because a lot of people think of heroin as a like 70s drug that. You know, but really, it's it's alive and well here in Missoula County. Uh, we're in, I don't know if you guys pay much pay attention to statistics, but I was just reading the FBI statistics, and we're like three times higher than Bozeman for violent crime and property crime. And, um, so it kind of works hand in hand when you have drug addiction, you have those property crimes because they're trying to feed those addictions. So um, it's always busy. It's always busy, and we're seeing more and more drugs. It's, it's too bad. But a dance. I'm going to end on a happy note. Anne's, Anne's waving me on. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like drugs and people die. That's really sad. <laughs> So, Tim, you want to take over? <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> We're going to hear from um, James McCubbin, he's with the County Attorney's Office. In your packet, you have the annual report for the County's Attorney, County Attorney's Office for 2018. Um, our website has all sorts of stuff that you can find. If you're looking for anything, start by using the big search box right in the middle of the home page. That'll help you look, find what you're looking for. Um, we also have a page that uh, lists all of the social media profiles for all of the different departments that the county has. So if you're ever interested in um, following a num any of us on Twitter, there's a lot of, we, we put some information out um, via Twitter, via Facebook. We're on Instagram now. We're not doing the Snapchat, but... Um, Um, but there's some good stuff. We also uh, keep a county blog. So if there's, um, you know, we have a pretty strapped uh, media uh, in Missoula. They're, they work really hard and have a lot of stuff to cover. So we try to help out by providing, I mean, it's, you know, it's not from a reporter, but it's from us. And we try to provide information um, about if significant things that may or may not otherwise be covered. Um, so, it, and there's a link to that on your on your quick links, or I think it's in the back of one of your budget and brief documents. Um, so we'll write about certain things that we think might be of interest. Um, I think we might have uh, written on the DUI treatment court that Judge Holloway was talking about. Um, if we're getting a lot of questions about one thing in particular, um, we'll we'll write about that just to try to um, provide more information to folks if they're curious about something. Um, so that's that. I mean, I could go on, but I, it's not my show at this point. I kind of want to make sure we get all grouped back up. So, do you guys look under your seats? Feel, feel under your seats. Does anybody know what those are? Cowboy hat holder. Oh. Don't tell the other group. Yeah. We'll surprise them with it. No hats allowed. Well, if you take it off, they, those are actually under the seats um, in the in the legislature. Also, when you can sit above the the House and the Senate, um, those are under those. So I oversee the commissioner's office staff, and I run the communications and projects department. I have three staff in the communications and projects department: a communications coordinator, a management analyst who helps provide management and or analytical support and analysis to um, the management level at Missoula County. And then I also have a project manager who I get to work with who they're all just awesome and amazing people who do incredible things and I'm quite proud. We launched a new website in 2015. We have an online um, agenda management system so that any public meeting that the commissioners have, you can look up the agenda, you can see the supporting documentation for all of those items. 
up until a few years ago, that was an agenda got, that got emailed out to a, you know, a group of people the day before at about 4 o'clock. Now we post it two days prior. You can read through the stuff that the commissioners are considering. Um, we're really making, trying to make a lot of advances to make sure that you're getting the information that you might be interested in, in learning more about. Uh, we also have uh, the budget brief is another document, another project that we've been developing because accessing uh, information about the county budget isn't always the least painful thing you could do in your day. So the budget and brief um, is designed to help kind of make some of that information just a little bit more easily digestible and um, is set to hopefully answer questions that we anticipate folks are having. Um, there were a lot of questions, for example, um, about voter approved bonds and levies. Um, oh, in the last couple of years, as I can um, imagine that you folks might have questions about also. So we um, uh, did a, a graphic that talks about the distribution of bonds and levies, voter approved bonds and levies that's in that, that budget and brief document. Um, the interesting thing about a tax bill can't believe I, I could talk about anything right now, and I choose to talk about a tax bill. <laughs> oh, you guys! Um, it's going to be different. No matter if you, you know, it's going to be different for me living in one neighborhood as it's going to be for someone living in uh, Tura, right? We all live in different districts. We have different taxing jurisdictions. It's the same with a ballot, right? So there's when we when we run an election, we have uh, how many pieces of paper? Like, so if you have a two-page ballot, and the ballot goes out to 60,000 people, so that's 120 pieces of paper that go out. But within those 120 pieces of paper, there, oh, Dana, why am I talking about this with you in the room? You could talk, how many ballot styles do we have? So, the we had 73 ballot styles. That's because um, you have 52 precincts. So, typically, if we didn't have that bond election on there, we would have only had 52. But due to that, Due to that fact, due to that split, um, many of our precincts had two ballot styles, one for the city that included the bond and one without the bond for the county president. There's some pretty complex stuff that comes with um, issuing ballots, issuing property tax bills. Everyone lives in a, in a different situation, not everyone, I mean you and your neighbors live in about the same kind of situation, right? Um, but uh, different parts of the county have different districts and different, um, different ballot styles. And we all communicate with each other. So the elections department, um, we maintain our own database of voter registration, um, but we work with the tax department and the GIS department to make sure that our records match what their records say and what you guys can click on on the GIS website and pull up and it says, you know, your tax in the Tura irrigation district and yes you are and you get that ballot style if it ever, ever, ever went to the election. But you all can make that change by signing up to serve on one of your community councils or one of your irrigation districts or et cetera, et cetera. How many special districts are there? Too many, I don't know that number. Oh, okay. Okay. Over 30. Yeah. If you figure in fire districts and things like that too. We also have over 30 boards and commissions that the commissioners appoint members to. So if you're ever interested in serving on a board or a commission, um, we are always looking for, for volunteers who can serve in that capacity. Dana works with an elections advisory committee. Those members are appointed yep. um, to that committee. Um, everything. And that information can you, the, the information about my board is in your packet, but online they do, um, the county does list the committees and boards that are in need of someone to serve on So you can apply directly there online to see that and if you do, you'll work with Sarah Bell because she manages all of the boards and commissions for Missoula County and handles hundreds of applications and letters every year to facilitate that. I feel like we got the band back together. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is, come on in. This is James McKevin. He's with the County Attorney's Office. I've talked about you on so is that on? Okay. Uh, hello, I'm James McCubbin. I'm a Deputy County Attorney. Um, I've been a Deputy County Attorney since 2001, starting in River Valley County and then moving up here. Um, I've been on both the civil side and the criminal side of the office, so 
uh, I get to tell you a little bit about what uh, the state courts do in the courthouse here as well as what the county attorney's office does. Uh, so this is uh, the historic courtroom uh, building um, and uh, we've tried to maintain it obviously in, in somewhat of a historical manner. Uh, it is a little echoey for a while uh, and recently removed. There were sound panels in here to reduce the echo. Uh, so if you have trouble hearing me, let me know. But um, I guess I'll start with, and I'm going to try and be kind of brief because it's getting late. But, um, so the courts that we have here, and we just recently uh, added, I mean recently as in, I believe, yesterday, added a fifth department to uh, the fourth judicial district uh, here in Missoula. Um, so there's five judges now. Uh, the judges all hear all kinds of cases. Uh, so they are state court judges uh, that we have here in the county courthouse. That's the way the court system works in Montana. Um, and the Montana court system is a little bit unique in that the district court judges hear all kinds of cases. We don't have separate cases for family law or criminal cases or civil cases, all the judges here, all the different kinds of cases. Um, and that is, uh, I think, a good thing because the judges have a breadth of experience. So um, this is one of the courtrooms where that happens. Um, the county attorney's office uh, represents both the county and the state. Um, in civil matters, the county attorney's office represents county commissioners on, in civil litigation, um, enforcement actions, or if somebody sues the county, uh, the county attorney's office will defend those lawsuits. Some lawsuits are, uh, or some litigation matters are taken out to outside counsel at the commissioner's discretion, um, but the county attorney's office does a lot of that litigation as well. And then uh, we have numerous types of cases that we work on in addition to general county litigation. Um, we have uh, mental health commitments that are on the civil side. We have child abuse cases that are civil cases. Uh, child abuse and neglect when people are having trouble parenting. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those cases relate to drugs, which brings us over to the criminal side. Um, I currently prosecute drug felonies. Um, that's one aspect of what we do. Obviously, any kind of felony work that we do is in district court. Uh, the county attorney's office also prosecutes misdemeanors that take place in the county, uh, but outside of city limits. If it's a misdemeanor that takes place in city limits, that goes to the city attorney's office. Uh, the county attorney's office also handles any misdemeanors that are in the same case with a felony. So our office handles all the felony prosecutions with related misdemeanors as well as misdemeanors that are in outside of city limits within the county. Um, let's see. There's our mental health. I think that's most of the general categories of what the county attorney's office does. but. Um, you know, in addition to just litigation matters, county attorney's office does provide legal advice to all of the county departments. Uh, so if there are road maintenance disputes or, um, or issues regarding uh, subdivision review, zoning, um, any kinds of legal issues that you might read about in the newspaper, uh, chances are somebody in the county attorney's office was involved in reviewing the matter or giving some kind of legal advice to county staff and county commissioners um, in the process that's going on there. Do you want me to cover anything else? Mm -hmm. Again, I'm trying to be quick. I think we had a handout of the county attorney's yep. report. Kirsten does a nice report every year. That gives a little bit more detail on the summary of some of the things we do and giving a little more statistics on the different types of cases and where our efforts go. So, yeah? CASA cases handled in this court or justice court? I'm sorry, what cases? CASA cases. Oh, CASA cases. So the court appointed special advocates um, work in the child abuse and neglect cases. So that is in district court. Um, those are they're civil cases, but they are in district court, yes. Yes. Yes.
I was not, uh, well, very early on I had a, a little bit of involvement, but um, I shifted to the criminal side of the office right when that was getting going. So it was heard in the courtroom? Yes, it was. So this, this courtroom, just really quickly, as part of the renovation project, all of the interior, all of the paint was, was redone, it was all refurbished. Uh, these, these up on the columns here are, are linen that were beginning to kind of deteriorate and degrade. We brought this incredible artist in named Amanda Bilby, and she re restored and, and retouched and actually recreated through paint. The, the textures and the patterns that you see here. This is my favorite part. This is plaster, it's not wood. It's painted to look like wood. It's just amazing. Um, and then all of the columns, all of the, all of the paint and the detail that you see is all, is all part of the courthouse renovation project. And I just have to point that out because we're very proud of it. And it's your building and we wanted it to look really good. So we, yeah, we, yeah. It really, it was an incredible process when the renovation was going on and, and you know, once the, the structural part got done and the painters were in here and it was, it, you know, it was the, like the Michelangelo thing where they're painting over their heads all day long. It was, it was really crazy. How did that get funded? Through a, a, a combination of a bonds, um, so, and that's those are funded through debt service with taxpayer dollars. And they were phased in over time. They also had some land sale money from our development park, and that's a whole other topic of conversation. Um, so, some money that the county owns, or land that the county owns, that was sold as part of a like a like a urban center, urban renewal. It's a tax and finance district, um, and then some federal loan or federal grant money for specifically for that emergency operations piece of it. Um, I have one more question. I've heard a lot of rumors about why the trees were cut down, mm -hmm. but I've never really heard what, what happened or what precipitated that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to give you the money. Um, so they were old and they were they were past their useful life. So um, if you were to talk to our risk manager, she would say <laughs> that making sure that we have trees that don't snap giant branches off and hit the public when they're walking down the sidewalk is probably a good idea. And so that was a big part of it. The other part of it is we had tree roots going into our sprinkler system, um, sidewalks, all of that kind of thing. And I know it was not super fun and it wasn't really great for folks to look at the courthouse lawn and not see those trees anymore. But we did plant new ones and they're beautiful and they're gonna flower, they're gonna leaf out and that's gonna be awesome. Yeah. Um, how did you guys add a fifth judge? Each, do you have another courtroom for that judge? Will they be splitting or how is that going to work out? We do actually. So in our original design for the courthouse renovation project, we had a court, what's now courtroom five, pegged as space that we were going to use for county functions to provide like training space or, or large meeting room space, which we're always kind of lacking. Um, but partway through the renovation project, uh, we redesigned and we knew we were holding that for an additional judge, but we just decided to go ahead and build that courtroom and make sure the offices were, were built out. We had, at one point, we had actually, Tim, your office, where your office is, that was just gonna stay kind of old, you know, big hallway, but we built out the offices in that to make room for, in, in anticipation for that, and um, we're glad we did. Yeah. Is there any final reasons why certain cases go into certain ones of these courtrooms, or is it just like um, yes and no. So courtroom one, um, it, it, I'll point to where the courtrooms are because I think the numbering is just wonderful. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. That's the way it is. But anyway, courtroom one um, is where we tend to have a lot of our law in motion, which is the regular um, kind of routine matters in court that not a lot of witness testimony, but procedural matters. I mean, we'll have 20, 30 cases in a, in a three hour session. That's law in motion. We tend to do most of that in courtroom one and the judges will rotate through there. Um, beyond that, um, it tends to be somewhat uh, driven by personal preference of the judges. 
Tim, Tim's nodding yes. <laughs> um, and uh, so Judge Larson actually holds his law in motion in here and uh, holds as many of his appearances in this courtroom as he can. Uh, he just really likes his courtroom. Um, Judge Deshaw tends to have his um, sessions that are not in law in motion in courtroom two, and I think that's primarily because his chambers are right next to it. Uh, similarly with Judge Townsend is, is right next to courtroom four, so she tends to have her, her matters there. Um, I suspect, but we'll, you know, time will tell, that uh, our new judge, Judge Bonato, will end up doing a lot of things in courtroom five. But, um, We'll see. So it's it's not a it's not a specific thing, but it's mostly the judges working together to coordinate. Uh, oh, the other and then the other thing is uh, when we have a particularly large case uh, in terms of number of witnesses, in terms of number of people that are likely to be in the audience, they'll tend to be in this courtroom. When we have um, the cure areas for for the folks who are coming in um, who aren't here by choice. Uh, to try to make sure that we're preserving safety um, for everyone uh, who's participating. Um, so in a couple of the more rooms, we have actual holding cells adjacent to, that were, that were part of the renovation project that were adjacent to, that were adjacent to the courts. Um, yeah. Um, and then we also added jury boxes in jury rooms because we were short on that as well um, for, the, for what we started with. All the courtrooms have a jury box and the jury room? Um, well, the jury rooms are not all next to the courtrooms, um, and not all of them have a jury box. So, like, courtroom one does not have a jury box, but yeah, the rest do. Right. Do you ever do uh, video sentencing or court through the video? Or yes, actually. So, um, and particularly in our law and motion sessions, we do, oh, about half, half the criminal matters are by video appearance from the jail so that we don't have to transport everybody back and forth. That saves quite a bit of time and expense because the jail is off site. Um, so, I mean, there are certain matters where defendants have the right to be present in court. Um, but we can do it just as effectively by video and I'd say the majority of defendants um, are fine with that and waive their right to personally appear and will do certain matters over video. Um, but then if they choose to personally appear or like if they're going to change their plea or something where they do need to be in court, then, then we will transport them over. Uh, so we do quite a bit of that. We can also do video appearances to um, I think pretty much any other courthouse in Montana is pretty unified on a video system that now exists, as well as multiple other state facilities. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So we and we commonly do this, and actually uh, on the video system. So every courtroom now has has a uh, has a monitor with a camera, um, and we can actually hook people in by Skype and things like that too. Works pretty well. Yeah. Do you have any information about um, cases that get settled by plea deal versus jury decision versus judge decision? Do you see any trends happening there? Um, well, we have, I, I mean, the majority of cases resolved by plea agreement, if you're talking about criminal cases, although it's also true on the civil side, the majority of civil litigation, whether the county's involved or not, the majority of, of any kind of litigation, civil or criminal, does resolve. Uh, prior to trial. So um, I don't have a specific statistic for you and it probably depends a little bit on the type of case as well. Um, some cases or some types of cases are just going to be a little bit more factually intense where it's, it's more going to be a question of what happened as opposed to we know what happened, what are we going to do about it? The, the latter category is going to be more uh, susceptible to having a plea agreement. But most, most, most cases do resolve, most criminal cases do, as well as civil cases. You guys are troopers. <laughs> we carted you all over this place tonight. I wanted to be. Feel under your chairs if you haven't already. And feel under your chairs if you haven't already. First half of the group are going to be this. Check them out. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody.
And we're going to have the mayor come in and present. We're going to have Dale Bickle, who's our CAO, who knows everything about our budget. But then we're going to spend the last 30 minutes with a group discussion. You have listened so well. Now it's your opportunity to, you know, actually un feel a little unfeathered and talk about what you have learned or what you still don't know, whatever it might be. So I'm going to just give you a couple quick questions to tantalize you. What surprised you to learn? What are your three biggest takeaways? What would you improve? Did the sequencing of our topics make sense to you? What seemed difficult to understand before entering the academy? And was it covered in some presentation? Was there anything that left you puzzled? Is there anything that left you frustrated about government? In what way do you think politics affects governing a city? And is that good, bad, or irrelevant? What makes you proud to be a Missouli? So, good, good. I want you to think about that all for the next week. And the last thing is just the whole list of our presenters week by week by week. On the back side of this, answer two and noodle on eight. Is that what you're yes. Okay. Noodle on ten, but you're going to answer to them. <laughs> on the back side of the noodling is a special section. You have the ability to not put your name, address, and all of that on there. It can be as anonymous as, as you wish for feedback. But if you'd like to put your name and you would like to be contacted by any of the press because they haven't been present but they do want to do some follow-up stories, you can say yes, I would like to on the bottom line. If there's a person on this list that you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, I'm taking a guess here that anybody that has presented would love to have that honor with each and every one of you. That includes both of you over there. So, um, <laughs> it, it, I think you get it. These people care about what they do and what the service and the programming that they provide. So I want you to think about that and we, I will let, who is the first one that has to go? Sorry. There was, anyway. Okay. With that, thank you all.